Amazing Gospel with Deaconess Victoria is a compilation of edited radio broadcasts Ag Gospel Half Hour with Deaconess Victoria. It is made up of talks comprising of a wide range of topics under the direction of the Holy Spirit, presented from a biblical perspective, in a simple and balanced manner. It is our prayer that you will find encouragement, correction, God's direction and blessing as you listen to these talks over and over again. God bless you, and may heaven at last be the portion of us all. Amen. Greetings in Jesus' precious name. This is Gospel Half Hour with Dickiness Victoria. Thank you for joining me. Please let us pray. Our Father and our God, we worship you this day. Thank you because you have made us in your own image and you have loved us so much that you gave your son to die for us on the cross of Calvary. And so we come into your presence by that precious blood of the Lamb. We receive forgiveness for our sins. We receive help to live holy and godly and power to conquer the world, sin, and Satan. Thank you for the promise of eternal life. Cause us, O Lord God, to see your face, to make heaven at last. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. By the grace of God, we shall continue with our talk, Dealing with Sexual Immorality, Part 2. Please let me read from Proverbs chapter 5. So let me read from verse 1. And it says, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen well to my words of insight, that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths are crooked, but she knows it not. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your best strength to others and your years to one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth, and your toil and reach another man's house. 11. At the end of your life you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. 12. You will say how I hated discipline, how my heart spawned correction. I will not obey my teachers or listen to my instructors. I have come to the brink of utter ruin in the midst of the whole assembly. 15. Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. He's talking about keeping to your wife. That's what it means. Do not let your springs overflow in the streets. It's talking to the man mainly, not to go about throwing his springs in the streets, if you know what I mean. 17. Let your wife be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? For a man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. The evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. The cords of his sin hold him fast. That means that immorality can be addictive. He will die for lack of discipline, led astray by his own great folly. Praise the Lord. So there we have read the whole chapter. Hallelujah. 
You see, it is not only physical traits we inherit from our parents, but we inherit character and spiritual traits as well. And that is why Jeremiah 31 verse 29 says that, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. For example, polygamy often tends to run in families. Having children outside of wedlock often tends to run in families. Sexual immorality and things like that often tend to run in families. But thank God because in the New Testament, as a result of the death of Jesus Christ, that law is broken in the believer in Christ Jesus, and his duty is to enforce it so that sins are not repeated or negative traits are not repeated in his life. Let me give you an innocuous example of what I mean. Years ago, I had a friend who gave birth to a set of twin boys. And one day, whilst they were still under six weeks of age, for some reason they could not sleep at night. She tried all her best to get them to sleep, but no way, these twins would not sleep. So in frustration, she laid them against her thighs in a kneeling position so that she could at least reach them and be petting them while she lay on her back, meaning to say that their lower bodies, their knees, legs were on the bed, and then their chest were resting on her thighs. And as she placed them in that position, guess what? All of a sudden, they slept off. And then she said to me, like father, like son, that their father had the habit of falling asleep on his knees while praying at night for as long as she had known him. Hmm, that was quite interesting to me. And in like manner, you find out that sometimes children who thumb suck tend to have parents who did the same as well. And this is the basis for inherited diseases in medicine. Often we hear doctors talking about inherited genetic diseases or traits in a family. The father is hypertensive, the grandfather was hypertensive, the children become hypertensive. Or you find diabetes running in a family or some other illness like that. Now, when it comes to spiritual things, that is why as fathers and mothers, we should be concerned about the legacy we are leaving for our children. King David in the Bible definitely had a love for women in his carnal nature, but because of his work with God, he kept it to a large extent under control. But unfortunately, at a time when he was careless, because the Bible says to watch and pray, he fell into what was probably the most wicked sin of his life. When we read the Bible in 2 Samuel 11 and 12, we find the story of his sin with Bathsheba, who was another man's wife, the wife to one of his soldiers. The Bible opens the story by saying, at a time when kings went out to war during spring, David decided to stay back at home. And it was during this time that he fell into this scene of adultery with Bathsheba. He decided to stay at home and laze about. Interestingly, warfare is a type of prayer or symbolic of prayer in the Bible. And Christians are kings as well and priests unto God. And so we should not be careless in the place of prayer, but we should watch and pray. Bible says, lest him who thinks he stands falls to sin. Well, God forgave him, but still in his divine judgment, there were consequences. God personally cursed David for this sin he committed. Because not only did he commit adultery with Bathsheba, but he also killed the husband in order to cover his sin. And God personally cursed David for this sin. And one of the things God said was that the sword will never depart from the house of David. The house of David included Israel as a whole because he was king and father of the nation. And like many of us are aware of, Israel has had a bloody history till date. How many people today, I wonder, are suffering from the sin of their parents or the sins of their leaders, as well as repeating the sin of their parents because the root has not been dealt with? Sexual immorality is that sin that cuts across the body, mind, and spirit. It is the quickest way by which evil spirits gain admittance 
into the lives of the participants, even without their knowledge. The Bible says that he that is joined to a harlot is one flesh with her. Many are suffering from things they know nothing about. I once read the sad story of a little girl whose father had raped someone in his younger years, and by the time she was 11, she had been raped at least five times. If you notice an evil tendency in your life, please fight it and break it. Don't pass it on to the next generation and do not allow your sin find you out first. 1 Corinthians 11.31 says, For if we will judge ourselves, we will not be judged. When the sin of David judged him, many people died as a consequence of his sin. And indeed, many are still dying today. When Samson's sin of sexual immorality judged him, he lost his eyes, he lost his ministry, he lost his honor and dignity, and he lost his life. Too many children have suffered for the sins of their parents. Too many have died prematurely because of the sins of their parents. When the devil wants to destroy people, he makes them too busy for prayers and the word of God. Let me encourage you. Please organize your schedule around God. Do not organize God around your schedule or around your life. Let God be the center of your life. Last week, we talked about David and his sin with Bathsheba and how he manipulated events to kill Uriah. We talked about the fact that that was the only time we knew when he committed the sin of adultery, but the consequences were grave. However, we also talked about Samson, who was a serial fornicator. Samson did not have a prayer life. He did not have the fear of God. It was his lifestyle to continue in sin. Bible says that a man who knows God does not easily continue in sin because the Spirit of God dwells in him. However, if we do sin, we should ask of God who forgives all men liberally. When we study the character of David, we notice some godly traits in him as a result of the fact that he had a lifestyle of prayer and worship of God. For example, he had the fear of God. Notice how he did not kill Saul when he had the opportunity to, because he genuinely feared God. In 1 Samuel 24 verse 5, it says, Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. If you know the background of the story, Saul had sought him out to come and kill him and had fallen asleep in a cave whilst looking for David. And here was David with the golden opportunity to kill Saul, but no, he did not. Instead, he just cut off a corner of his robe just to show that he had the opportunity to do so but did not. And even after cutting off his clothes, he felt conscience stricken. So David was really a man of prayer. He was a man of worship of God. He was the one who organized choirs in the tabernacle to worship God, made instruments to worship God with, Remember, he was the one who danced before God till his clothes fell from his body when they were bringing the ark of God from the house of Obedidom into the city of David. He was called the sweet psalmist of Israel. He was excited about worshiping God. Psalm 122 verse 1 says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. This was David speaking. He enjoyed being in God's presence. He danced before the Lord in 2 Samuel 6, 14 to 16, like I said, until his outer garment fell off in worship. And his wife, Michael, the daughter of Saul, the previous king before him, despised him because of the way he comported himself as he served before God. And so let me make a side journey here. Some of us are directors. Some of us are men of timber and caliber, owners of industries, and big men, so to say, in society. But can we lay all we are down before God to truly worship him? 
or when we are even in church in his presence, we are too big to clap our hands or dance before him. That is food for thoughts. David was also humble because he repented immediately, notes, when Nathan the prophet confronted him about his sin with Bathsheba. God forgave him, but he was still severely punished for his indiscretion. David had a heart of service. He was a servant king. Even as a shepherd boy, he put himself on the line when a lion or bear attacked his sheep. And remember, he also put himself on the line to fight Goliath in the behalf of Israel, his people. He loved God, and he was also self-disciplined. In 1 Samuel 18, the Bible says he behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him under the service of King Saul. I say all this to buttress the fact that as Christians, we should watch and pray. It's not just enough to pray, but watch and pray. Ask God for grace to live on God, to be at the right place at the right time, not to give room to the flesh, but to die daily and take up our cross daily so that we are not like Samson who had a weakness with sexual immorality and fell into it repeatedly, who whenever he entered a new town, all that caught his interest were not the buildings, not the flowers, not the beauty of the city, but women all the time. And that was his undoing. Hallelujah. And so how do we conquer sexual weakness and immorality? Number one is to flee from temptation. We have read Proverbs 5. Flee from temptation. There we see the wise man Solomon warning against adultery, telling his son to keep only to his wife and not to let his springs overflow in the streets or his streams of water in public squares, but to keep only to his wife and to let her be his alone and be satisfied always with her. Hallelujah. I encourage you to read it again and again. Everyone should read it again and again. But unfortunately, just like David, Solomon fell into the scene of adultery and sexual immorality. And that made him to turn away from God. Because at some point, his flesh became surfeited with the good things of life. And he stopped to watch and pray. This was a man who had had an encounter with God twice in his life. But at the end of his life, he began to build temples for the idols of the nations around him because he went after the women of those nations who worshipped idols. So let us be careful. The people we associate with, the people we choose to marry, they should be men and women who fear God and who walk with God. Sexual sin is often attractive. It has a certain charm that invites and allures with seductive and smooth speech. It is also addictive. Proverbs 5.22 Like any appetite, the more we feed sexual sin, the more it grows. The more we commit it, the more we will feel we need it. The easier it will be to do it and the harder it will become to stop. But by the grace of God, we can flee from it. Like it says in Proverbs 5, 7 to 8. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Flee sexual sin. Flee TV programs that have a sexual undertone or pornographic sites on the internet. Things that make you to fall into sexual sin. If you need to, unsubscribe from channels that make you fall into sin. I know someone who permanently canceled his satellite TV subscription because some of the sights and sounds were a challenge to him keeping his thoughts pure. If need be, change your phone from an Android phone if you cannot control yourself and get a handset. Be careful where you visit. Break up relationships that make you fall into sin. Change jobs if need be. Because your eternity is at stake here. If you think this is too much an overreaction, consider the consequence of sexual sin. Verse 23 
of that Proverbs 5 says, such a person who indulges in sexual sins will die for lack of discipline, led astray by his own great folly. And death here includes spiritual death, an eternal separation from God in hell. Sexual sin is attractive and addictive. You are controlled by something out of your grasp. It makes you lose your sense of self-worth and self-respect. Many have struggled with it to a point where they have given up and feel that there is nothing they can do in their power anymore to break free. Yes, there may be nothing you can do in your power, but by the grace of God, when you give your life to Christ, he can give you the power to break free from it. Praise the Lord. Another thing you can do to deal with sexual immorality is to run from wrong association. Nobody corrupts himself without external influence. People start smoking under the influence of friends. Some of us were good until we started associating with certain people. Some did not start sleeping around until they began moving with a certain person or a certain group of people. So break away from that man or woman who entices you into sexual immorality. Break away from that man or woman you are sleeping with outside marriage. Collect the key to your house from them or change your lock if need be. Block them out of your phone. It is better to offend men and yourself than to offend God. David, a man who knew God, offended God and the world is still paying for it. Abraham disobeyed God and the world is still bleeding from it today. Control the lusts in your body by the help from the Spirit of God. Romans 8, 13 to 14 says, For if you live after the desires of the sinful nature, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit of God, do mortify or kill the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led and controlled by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You see, the flesh is not going to heaven, and so it wants to enjoy itself here on earth. The flesh will be buried in the earth after death. It is the soul that will go to heaven or to hell. And so fight the loss in your flesh daily. And that is the meaning of carrying your cross daily that the Lord Jesus Christ talked about in Matthew sixteen twenty four, And that is the meaning of the dying to self daily that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians fifteen thirty one. Praise God. Another way to deal with sexual immorality that may be in us is to consider the future. Remember you sin against your own body. It is a covenant when you enter into sex with somebody outside of marriage, and indeed even in marriage. Fornication and adultery is the only sin that cuts across the body, mind, and spirit. When you enter into sexual relationship with somebody, you enter into a covenant with them and whatever spirits, whatever evil covenant they carry, you become a part of it. And that is why sexual immorality is probably the worst of all sins. It is a serious sin that poisons the whole system. Sexual immorality is a sacrifice that empowers the kingdom of darkness what it means is that whenever sexual immorality is being committed, demons are readily present to empower themselves. They feed off of that relationship. Bodies or places where sexual immorality is being committed are filled with demons. Since your body becomes the temple of God when you give your life to Christ, it is a must to keep yourself and flee from every form of sexual immorality, including masturbation. If you have involved yourself in such before you repent, please ask Jesus to cleanse you and do not go back to it by his grace. Hallelujah. Number four, dealing with sexual immorality, please mind your mind. That's because the mind plays a very important role in sexual perversion. Often you start it in the mind before you perform it in the body. To battle the mind problem, please memorize many scriptures and continually think on the word of God and speak it out loud over yourself to break the hold of that negative mindset. First John 2.14 says, 
you have overcome the wicked one. Psalm 1 from verse 1 says, Blessed in the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Stockpile your thoughts with good things. Philippians 4, 8 says, Whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is of good reports, think on these things. Praise the Lord. Discipline yourself to think on things that are good. Romans 12, verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, meditate on God's word. Another thing is speak the word of God over yourself often every day. Say things like, my body is the temple of God. I treat the older women as mothers, the younger women as sisters with all purity as I would my sisters. That is 1 Timothy 5.2. See human beings as spiritual beings made in the image of God and see them as carriers of God's spirit. Do not see human beings as Tools to be used to satisfy your lusts. If you're a man, when you see a woman, just like Job 31.1, covenant with your eyes not to look lustfully at a woman. Because I know a man is moved by the things he sees. Train yourself not to cast a second look. If you must talk to a woman, look at her face. Don't undress her down. Praise the Lord. Another thing useful is fasting and prayer. Devils are responsible for sins and addictions. Sometimes there are foundational curses and covenants that promote and propagate negative patterns in people's lives and in families. And to cast out devils, you need to generate power by fasting and prayer. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ in reference to a devil when the disciples asked him, why could not we cast it out? said, this type goeth not out but by fasting and prayer. If you fast for one day, it doesn't go. Fast for three days. And you can fast without food, only water. For up to even 40 days like the Lord Jesus Christ did. Hallelujah. But I will not encourage you to do that at the beginning. You can build up your stamina. Build up yourself first. Fast for a day until evening. 6 or 9 p.m. before breaking. Then you can fast for three days. Break every evening. And then you can now try fasting three days without food, only water. And then you can try seven days. That devil will go in Jesus' name. Especially if you are standing with another believer in faith. Because one will chase a thousand, two will chase ten thousand. Hallelujah. Lastly, remember and be conscious that God has released grace for deliverance and that God is watching us. Uphold the purity of your marriage and of your children, even if you are not married. Uphold the purity of your marriage to come and that of your children through a firm decision to do what is right before God. Have you noticed that, like I said earlier, children tend to repeat the sins of their parents? For example, Abraham lied about his wife Sarah, saying that she was his sister. Isaac, his son, did the same. And Jacob carried lying and deceit to the next level by deceiving his father. Do whatever you can to remain pure, trusting God for the grace. Remember that God loves you and I. It may have started from a rape sometimes, or some troubled adult who abused you as a child or a young person, and then because of that, you find yourself falling continually into the sin of immorality. But now you are grown up and an adult. You are responsible for your own actions. Romans 14, 12 says, So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Forgive the person who may have abused you as a child, because without that, you cannot move forward. And you need to forgive them so that you can be free. Also, John 1, 12 says, As many as received Jesus Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Also, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Hallelujah. We are not to serve the devil with our flesh, with our body. 
but to serve God who has made us in his own image. And this may not be easy in your own self, but with the spirit of God inside of you, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And so I want to encourage you to please give your life to Christ and trust him to break these shackles off your life because I know many are tired of it and want to break free. So let us pray. Pray after me and say, Almighty God, I come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ. Forgive me of all my sins. And in particular, forgive the sin of immorality. I repent from this sin in Jesus' name. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Even as I invite Jesus to come and indwell me. From today, I will live to serve and please God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, I pray in the name of Jesus that the yoke of sin be broken off your life and grace to live for God be released unto you in Jesus' name. I encourage you to read your Bible and pray every day. Start your day with prayer. Find time to pray in the afternoon. End your day with prayer before you sleep. Read the word of God every day. I do not want to be legalistic, but I encourage you to read at least four, five chapters minimum of God's word every day. And you can start reading from the book of Matthew. Ensure that you memorize scriptures and think on them as you go through the day. Please get a Christian devotional booklet for your daily prayers, like our daily bread, our daily manna, seeds of destiny, open heavens, daily fountain, and so on. There are so many out there, and you can download one or two online for your use. Join a godly Bible-believing church, and please be a worker there. And if you have any questions, I encourage you to please write me at dickinessvictoria at gmail.com, and you can tune to our YouTube channel to listen to more messages. Gospel Half Hour with Dickiness Victoria. God bless you. The Lord God keep us all in purity and holiness so that we will see his face someday. In Jesus' name, amen.